Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our exciting, fascinating conversation about one of my favorite subjects, patent models and American innovation. I am Betsy Brun. I am the Margaret and Terry Stent Director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I'm really excited to see all of you here in the audience, and I know we have a lot of out-of-towners, so special thanks to all of you for coming. If this is your first visit to the museum, we hope you'll come back very often. Now, the theme of innovation is celebrated in two important exhibitions here tonight. One is up on the third floor, the Great American Hall of Wonders. It was curated by Claire Perry, she takes a very thoughtful look at how Americans came to conceive of the idea that we as a people have a special genius for invention. Uh, we collaborated on that project with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and I'm very grateful to everyone there and to the director, David Kapos, who may be here tonight or may still be in transit, for um, all the collaboration we had. The second exhibition has just opened. That's the one we're focused on tonight. Uh, it's on the second floor in the South Wing called Inventing a Better Mousetrap. It features 35 patent models from the Rothschild Collection in upstate New York. The curator for that exhibition is Dr. Charles J. Robertson, and he's going to describe the genesis of that show, and in just a minute, he'll also introduce Alan Rothschild. But first, I want to offer a really special thanks to those who made the exhibitions possible. I especially want to acknowledge the law firm of Harness, Dickey, and Pierce for their important gift, and also the law firm of Nairo, Haller, and Nairo in Chicago. I especially thank also Rita R. and Alan J. Riley for their support of this exhibition. They made it happen. Now, it's fun for me to introduce Charles. This is certainly not the first exhibition he has curated for us. He is, hands down, the leading expert on the history of this noble landmark building. And he, of course, tells the story in a book called The Temple of Invention and an exhibition of the same name about how the building was constructed to be the nation's patent office. And the intention was to display to the public all the scale models that were submitted with the patent applications. So I hope all of you saw that show when we opened in 2006. It was on view on the second floor. And that was followed by another show that Charles curated for us that was all about President Lincoln's inaugural ball in 1865 right here in this building. But even before Charles began his curatorial career, he had 16 years of service as our deputy director concluding only in 2002. And way back in the dark ages, he earned a Master of Arts in Art History from Harvard University. Then he served in the Army Counterintelligence Corps. Then he acquired a Juris Doctorate and practiced law in Washington, D.C. for several years. He has, throughout all this time, been extremely involved with historic preservation. He was 12 years on the D.C. Historic Preservation Review Board he has been an officer or a board member of the American Association of Museums, the Victorian Society of America, the American Architectural Foundation, the Octagon House Museum, and the Cosmos Club Heritage Preservation Foundation. I also just have to add that he is a very, very warm and cherished friend of mine and of many here in this uh, auditorium. So Charles, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that very generous introduction, Betsy. Uh, I blush. Um, when Betsy and I were discussing a subject for the third exhibition I would curate in the Riley Gallery here in the museum, we decided, of course, what better topic than patent models? It was sort of a no-brainer, since this is the patent office building, and as Betsy mentioned, there were thousands of models on display in the enormous galleries in the building's third floor. So, uh, through, Ale through Richard Malsby, our friend at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, we were put in touch with Alan Rothschild of Casanova, New York, who owns 4,000 patent models the largest such private collection in the world. So I called Alan, and he uh, immediately 
agreed to lend patent models to the exhibition and invited me to Casanova to select any models I wished for the exhibition from his vast collection. <clears throat> well, fortunately, I didn't have to look through 4,000 patent models, but only 800 that he had restored and had on view in a gallery attached to his home. So thus came to be this exhibition, and some of you have already seen it, many of you will see it, and others I hope will come back to see it because the exhibition will be on view for the next two years. Betsy? Yes. This was the point at which we were intending to start the conversation. However, we have a late breaking announcement that I want to share with you, very <coughs> exciting to make. You know, we developed a great rapport with Alan and Ann Rothschild during the long genesis of this wonderful show. And they have just donated to us 25 of these patent models to be part of our permanent collection. So, you know, we see it as a homecoming because all 25 models were here in the 19th century and now they're gonna come back and live, we hope in perpetuity, back in the place where they began, in this temple of invention uh, to inspire future generations about innovation. These are the very first patent models to enter the permanent collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. We are very grateful to you, Alan and Ann Rothschild. Thank you so much. Welcome. So now, we'll proceed. Alan, as the focus of the program, let me begin by uh, asking if you could tell us a little bit about your personal background. Sure. I was born in <clears throat> Syracuse, New York, five days after Pearl Harbor was bombed. I was the youngest son. I had uh, two older brothers, Lee and Gerald, and my family history was that of um, the business part of operating pharmacies in, in Syracuse. We had three professional uh, pharmacies, and my father was a pharmacist. Um, my, both my older brothers were pharmacists. And when it came time for me to go to college, um, guess what I did? Uh, <laughs> if you guessed going to pharmacy school, you guessed right. I went to uh, the Albany College of Pharmacy and part of Union University in Albany, New York. I, I graduated pharmacy uh, college but I had to take the state boards in New York State before I became a, a registered pharmacist. I, I took those right after um, graduating. And by a small miracle, I, I did pass the boards. I, I was not a great student, which there's some of my friends here today probably could vouch for that. Um, and then I went to work in, in the family business. And after about three or four years of counting pills from a, from a big bottle into a little bottle and, and putting a label on it for, for the patient use, I really decided, you know, did I really want to do that for the rest of my uh, working career? And the decision was, uh, I really didn't. And I, that was, at that point, the end of my pill counting days. What I, I did do is I, I stayed in the family business I created a separate company to distribute uh, medical supplies and equipment for physicians, uh, clinics, nursing homes, and hospitals. And to that company, I, I added a interior uh, medical design uh, group that designed uh, medical office spaces for uh, new physicians and remodeling old and, and that basically was for totally equipping um, the offices from, from all of the furnishings to all of the medical equipment and to, to all of the supplies. Um, that led to um, the, um, a, a new, another new business of, of actually building medical office buildings and, and managing them and also had another uh, separate business of supplying home health care products um, for those that needed products and services um, at their homes. I'm partially retired now. 
and I, but I still do go to my office um, three days a week. And I believe your uh, collecting career started with <clears throat> a model Ford. In right after I graduated, <laughs> well, right after I uh, right after I graduated high school, <laughs> um, I came upon this Model A Ford that that was um, 30 years old at the time. It was a Model A uh, Ford Sport Coupe, and I decided I, I would like to buy it. I, I talked to my parents about it, and they really were not sure about um, about buying it. They, they really didn't understand why would I want a 30-year-old car? Um, you know, most, um, most kids my age at that point, you know, would, if they want a car, they'd want a, maybe a two or three-year-old car. And it was a hard question for me to answer, but my answer was, is I liked the looks of it. I, I thought it was neat, I thought it was cool and I thought it would be a fun project to, um, to, to restore. And I did end up buying it. My, my older brother, Lee, um, took an interest in it and, and we, re we restored it um, back in the late 1960s. It didn't look like this when we were done. This actually is a second restoration that, um, that took place about eight or nine, eight or nine years ago. I then, um, I then became... Um, and you started collecting uh, items, apothecary items, yeah. right, related to your pharmacy. And um, that started um, when I was in pharmacy school in, in Albany. I had to, um, I had to do a, a project, and I, and I chose to do um, the history of patent medicines. And patent medicines weren't actually um, patented by the patent office. That was the, the name they had. And they basically were concoctions of, of, of many, many different things, um, medicinals. A lot of them were alcohol and other substances. They could be done by an individual. They could be done by a company. Um, but this was before the um, FDA Act of um, 1906, and they really were medicines that the um, person that labeled the bottles, they, they basically could put anything they wanted on there, and, and th that's what they did. Anything from remedying a cold to any type of Ill illness to, to curing cancer, they even uh, claimed. Tape warms for slimming people, right? Yeah, everything, everything, everything under, under the sun. So that was um, the beginning of, of my collecting for apothecary items. I, with the encouragement of a uh, professor at school, we talked about the possibility of possibly opening up an apothecary shop uh, back home in Syracuse that would be an authentic reproduction of a apothecary, what it would, what it would have been like in the, in the 1900s. And this professor put me in contact with a retired pharmacist in Albany named Samuel Aker, who had a massive collection of apothecary items. And actually his collection ended up upon his passing at the uh, Smithsonian American History Model. But he got me started uh, collecting, and I then went on to um, add to the collection some from him, and then um, adding quite a few other items. And when I finished, there was about 5,000 cataloged items. I did open up the apothecary shop um, in Syracuse. It was in one of our uh, pharmacies, and it was open to the public for 25 years. And in the late um, 1980s, when the Science Museum downtown um, went into the new armory that they had just converted, um, I donated that collection, um, and it was donated to the Museum of Science and Technology in um, Armory Square in Syracuse, New York. And that, that's still there today, and it's open to the public, and hopefully it'll be there um, you know, for many, many more years to come. For, people to get to enjoy and to see 
the history of pharmacy and, and what an apothecary was like in the early 1900s. Well, when did you become interested in patent models? <clears throat> uh, soon afterwards, um, after I donated the collection, um, I, I stumbled upon um, patent models with my wife Ann. We were um, going to an an antique show in upstate New York. And, and when, I, when I saw these, I, I really, I never, number one, I never had seen one before. I, I didn't really know what they were, but I knew immediately, it was kind of when I saw the Model A for the first time, I, I, I knew I, I really wanted to you know, find out more about these and, and I knew that I really liked them right from, right from the get-go. Um, that day I, I purchased um, three or four of them I went back home, I still remember it was a Saturday, and, and Sunday morning I, I got up and I said, you know, I, I think I really should go back and, and buy a few more. <laughs> I probably would have been better off if I had just slept late. Um, but, but, I, but I did go back, um, and I bought three or, three or four more, and that, and that was the beginning. After that, I, I did an exhaustive study on, on the models, I found out their history, and I decided to add to the collection. And I, I bought a few more uh, that I found from some collectors. I um, found out about some auctions where there were some um, models I could uh, possibly buy, which I did. And I actually put in a, um, ads in several antique journals and I, I got some real good re replies from some people that had some collections for uh, many, many years and they thought maybe it was time to give them up. So I, I did buy um, two or three um, smaller collections, but then I came upon Cliff Peterson. And Cliff well, yeah, then, uh, I mean, you might have gotten a few hundred that way, but how did you wind up with 4,000 patent well, models? Well, that, that's, where, that's, where, <laughs> that's where Cliff comes um, into the story. Cliff Peterson was a, an aerospace <laughs> engineer um, out on the West Coast. He, he developed an interest um, in the models um, many years before I was in contact with him. And he basically had, um, his collection was still intact from when the patent office um, auctioned them off through an act of Congress um, in 1925. And they were sold at auction um, in New York City to a individual named Sir Henry Welcome, who was the founder of the uh, Welcome Drug Company, which later turned into Galaxo Welcome. He died soon afterwards. They went into his estate. And I think he wanted to open a patent he, model museum he, in New York, which never happened. Yeah, right? he, that happened. Um, he died and his estate then ended up selling the models um, to a couple individuals in New York City and they held them for just a short time. And then in 1939, an individual um, named O. Rundle Gilbert, who was uh, living in Garrison on the Hudson, he bought them. He held them for 40 years, and he had many, uh, many, many sales. He had auctions, and he had a fire. And he ended up selling the collection that he had left to, to uh, Cliff Peterson in 1979. And Cliff also bought them with the intentions of, of selling them, which he did. And when I um, met up with Cliff um, in the early uh, 1990s, um, we became friends. He was getting up in age, and I explained to him what I wanted to do, and that was to create a museum. And he sold me, um, a, a small group and then a larger group and myself and Ann, we would uh, visit him from time to time out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And he said, why don't you buy the, the rest of my collection, the personal collection, the models that I have kept that I haven't sold after all these years. And one thing led to another and sure enough, I ended up um, buying the remainder of his uh, very, very large collection and the total sum is about 4,000 models. And uh, why are these models such a unique and perhaps unrecognized part of American history? Well, the models are unique um, 
Charles, because there was only there was only one model for for each invention that the, the patent office um, gave to an inventor, and they they really are they really are works of art. They they truly are historic artifacts, and they they provide a, a visual history of our country when it was transformed from a rural society into an industrial giant. The, the models represent U.S. patents uh, that were issued during the 1800s, and these models and, and their inventors were what really spawned the Industrial Revolution in this country. They're, they're unrecognized mainly because they, they were put into storage um, in the patent office from this building. They were put into storage in the, you know, the 18, uh, 90s, around eight, 1890s. 90, yeah. <clears throat> and, and they remained in storage until 1925, as we mentioned, when they were auctioned off. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> in prior to that, in December 15th, 1836, in the patent office before this building was built, there was a fire, about 10,000 models were destroyed. And actually in this building on September 24th of 1877, in the uh, west wing and the north wing, there was about 80 to 90,000 models yeah, destroyed. 87,000. 87,000. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, Gilbert had a fire. So the models, number one, were now very, very limited in their number. But the main point is, is that people really never got to see these models. Just like when I saw them for the first time, I had no idea what they are or what they were or what they represented. And they, they really have um, been missing for 125 years it, um, before they really have been, been seen lately. Um, there, there's been some exhibits that I have had and the Cooper Hewitt had an exhibit in, in 1983. That was probably the largest um, exhibit in the last uh, two or three decades. So it's just now that people are, are realizing what the models are. Right. Um, you've been gradually restoring this horde of models and have installed, you know, the 800 in the, the wonderful gallery you built uh, attached to your home. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Well, as I mentioned, I started out buying, um, you know, just a handful and I, I brought them home. I had them in my living room and then as I mentioned, I bought a few more and a few more came in my living room and then a few more. And then all of a sudden I started taking the books off our bookshelves and <laughs> putting patent models on there, and, and, and before I knew it, um, my wife was saying, you know, our whole house is gonna be filled up with patent models, and there was gonna be no books left, and so I really had to make a decision. If I, if I was gonna continue to, to do this, then I really needed to do something to, to still have a home, um, and a, and a, you know, and a place to live in, and a, place when people came over that they weren't stumbling over patent models. So I, I kind of you know, um, looked all over um, in my home to see where, where I could do this. And I, I finally came up with a space, um, very, very large attic space that, that had rafters in them. And I, I, I got a hold of an architect who happens to be here tonight. And, and, and we looked to try to figure out how we could um, actually built a space in a museum and we, we did work that out. Um, I built a museum that, that does hold um, 800 models now. And I ended up um, after that uh, applying to New York State Education Department. We uh, became actually a, um, a museum. We have museum status in, in New York State. And I started, you asked about restoring models. I, I pretty much started restoring models um, right from the very, very beginning. Some of the work um, I started out doing myself, but it got a little overwhelming. Um, however, I, I have a group of, um, of prof professional um, restorers. A, a few of them are actually here tonight. And I work very, very closely with them and, and we follow um, museum archival standards in, in restoring the models. 
Uh, and I'm hoping everyone tonight will get to, to come see what these models look like in the, uh, in the exhibit. But in the basement are a lot of unrestored models. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I made him take this slide. <laughs> And some are still in boxes. They've yeah. never been unpacked. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a picture of just a, uh, before part of the models um, in my basement. My entire basement um, is, is filled up with models. And, and this, is, uh, this is a slide of, of my garage with about 500 more models that really haven't been unpacked in the last 20 years. And um, maybe if I live long enough, mm -hmm. um, I will get to those boxes. It's a lifetime project. It's a lifetime project for uh, for a lot more of um, people like myself, um, right. and but I'm enjoying it. But I don't know if I'll ever get to do all four thousand models. Anne will continue the tradition. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Alan's wife, uh, but each model has an identification tag attached to it. Yeah, the tag is a very, very important um, part of the model because that is really the only thing that really identifies the fact that it is a patent model, let's say compared to what would have been called at that time a salesman sample, which people sometimes confuse with, right. with, with, mm -hmm. with patent models. So it's very important that that tag you remain with the model and sometimes that's hard because the tags get separated or lost and then you don't know if it really was a, a patent model or, or what it was. The, the patent tag was attached uh, to the model when it, when it received its patent by the patent office. In the, in the left hand corner is the uh, patent number and then on the top is the inventor's name and, and below that is a description of what, what the patent was uh, four, and then on the bottom it has the um, it has the uh, the month, the day, and the year that that it was patented. And if you notice on the top, there's there's a li little hole in the tag, and and there's there's a length of of red twill tape, and that tape is what held the model um, the tag onto the model. It was either tied onto the model, or in some cases, it, on some of the wood models, it was actually nailed. Um, nailed to the model. And I'm sure all of you have heard the expression government red tape. This is, this is where the expression emanated from was the use of, of that red twill tape um, on the models by the, by the patent office. Fascinating. And uh, I understand that you've lent your patent models to a national touring exhibition and also, amazingly, to Disney World in Paris. Well, my, my original intent um, when I was collecting all these models um, was always to, um, to create a National Patent Model Museum and an invention center in, in Syracuse, um, Syracuse, New York. And I worked on this project for several years. I, I worked with New York State. I worked with the SUNY system. It's the State University of New York. I worked with Syracuse University, with Cornell University, and with MIT. And we did get a commitment um, finally from New York State and um, from SUNY to actually build the um, museum and invention center in Syracuse. We actually had a, a land picked out and was designated um, for the museum. But unfortunately, 9-11 happened and the funding, the funding disappeared. And that was the end of the project. I then had to make a decision what to do next. And I, and I really, after thinking about it for quite a bit, I said, maybe the best thing for me to do with the models would, would be to, to, get, to form a traveling exhibit and have the models travel throughout the US so they could be seen by people and, and become recognized, which we talked about before as being unrecognized. And um, I was very, very lucky. We ended up with, with a company called Smith Kramer out of Kansas, Missouri, and they agreed uh, with me to put together uh, a traveling exhibit of 58 models. And it started out that they um, said they would have to get six museums signed up 
for, the, for it actually to, to become a reality. And sure enough, um, because there really have, has never been, this would have been the very first ever traveling exhibit of patent models in the country, um, 13 museums had um, signed up wow. uh, for, for the exhibit. And, and right now it's about um, halfway through. It's in uh, the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York right now. Mm -hmm. And Paris. And also, um, we have an exhibit of um, 53 models in, in Euro Disney in, in Paris, France. That has been there for several years. And, and right now, they are so much enjoyed um, at Disney that there, there really is no end date to the, to the end of that exhibit. Right. Excellent. And uh, what particularly appealed to you about lending your models to this exhibition and then subsequently donating a selection to the museum? Well, once again, we talked about them being unrecognized. And what better place in the world would there be for me to have these models on exhibit at the Smithsonian American Art Museum where, where the models were originally? This building was built in, um, eight, it was begun to be built in 1836. And the models were exhibited in the, in the Museum of Models here up until the, um, the late 1880s. And hundreds of thousands of people um, came to Washington and, and visited this building and visited these yeah. models. Evidently, this was the most popular um, tourist attraction in Washington during the 1800s. About 100,000 a year came to see the models. And now that the exhibit is here, um, I think my numbers are, are correct. I, I've been told that probably for the two years that that the exhibit will be open, there'll, there'll be well over two, mil two million people will have, will have come in to, to, see the, to see the models and, well, and the museum. It, into the museum. We hope they'll all go see the models. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that was the impetus for, for me to, you know, to want, want the collection um, to, to be here. And, and, and the reason that, that I donated the models was because I wanted to have a few less than 4,000. <laughs> um, I know, um, you know, 25 models doesn't sound like a lot when you have 4,000, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. Well, Alan and, was very generous in letting <laughs> me select the models. There were a few of his favorites that he couldn't let go, but uh, he was extremely generous. Thank you very much for that. Um, and really what it's about is, you know, it's a homecoming. The models are coming back home. You know, after being after being on a, on a absent for 125 years, right. the, these models are are coming back to to their original home. And you know, most of the models never made it into the into the marketplace in the in the real world. And and I, and I can't think of a better legacy than there possibly could be than to honor these inventors with, with these models. And it really, it, it continues their legacy. Um, yes, it does. With, with, them, with them being here. And, and Betsy talked about perpetuity. Uh, I believe that that's what, that's what this will be. Good. Now, I know you have favorite models in the exhibition. So uh, could you tell us, tell us what they are and something about them? Because you're the expert. Well. That's one of the questions everybody always asks me, which is my favorite model? And that's, that's a very difficult question. But I, I, have, um, I have called through um, what is in the exhibit. And, and, and I do have some favorites that, that I could talk about. The, the artificial leg is, is one of those. The, the inventor was Benjamin Jewett. And he was the owner of the Jewett's Patent Leg Company. And Jewett claimed that uh, this leg had an improved uh, knee spring and knee joint, which, which could be used in all cases where the amputation um, was above the knee and in some cases um, below the knee. Th this particular um, artificial leg played a very, very important role in, in the state of North Carolina after the, after the Civil War. Um, the, the, the war ended. And one of the unfortunate results of the Civil War was, was the loss of a massive number of, of, of limbs, ar arms and legs, 
and actually on, on both sides. Th this was caused by, by the fact that in advances in, in military weapons and accurate firepower uh, were extremely destructive to the soldiers. And in spite of these advancements, military tactics remained the same. The s soldiers lined up on both sides like they had done in previous wars. The, the bugles were, were blown, the, the soldiers marched towards each other. And this time, it was a lot different. The, the, the rifles shot straight, the cannons shot straight, the, the barrels were rifled, and there was massive, um, massive deaths and, and massive damage, especially to the limbs. And at this time, because there, there were so many um, injuries, the, the, uh, the Civil War surgeons had no choice. Um, the time factor was there, uh, infection would set in, so the quickest thing to do would be to, to amputate um, amputate the limbs. In February of 1866, the governor of North Carolina, Jonathan Worth, um, sent out a request to all the county sheriffs to compile a list of, of all the veterans who had lost their limbs. And then the assembly of, the General Assembly of North Carolina passed a resolution to um, supply at no charge um, an artificial leg to the amputees. If they didn't want the leg, they would receive $75. The uh, Jewett Patent Leg Company um, was awarded a contract to furnish the artificial legs um, to all the amputees in the state. And the contract actually specified the, the leg that was to be used um, and the leg that, that was in the contract was this actual leg that's in, in this exhibit that's, that is shown here. And it was patent numbered uh, 29494. And the contract said that the Jewett would have, he was from New Hampshire, and the contract said that he would have to open up a shop in North Carolina um, for the amputees to go to. And he did open up the shop in, in Raleigh. The, the capital. The, the mm -hmm. capital. And the state also paid um, for the transportation um, for the veterans to, to go to get their leg and then paid the transportation uh, for them to go back home. Yeah, have to be fitted. At, in, it would be right. fitted in, in the shop in, right, in Raleigh. Right, right. Fascinating. Uh, do you have another favorite you could tell um, us about? A, another one would, um, would be the, the life-preserving stateroom um, <laughs> that, that Henry Halleck um, patented in, in pre-Civil War, 1858, and, and he was from Brookhaven, New York. And, and when we talk about um, ships and passenger safety, we, we immediately think of the sinking of the Titanic in, in 1912. And many think the sinking of the Titanic um, instigated a national focus on, on ship safety. However, a quick look back at, at the patent um, history proves concern for nautical safety uh, was long before 1912. Uh, one of the most interesting looking models in the exhibit is this uh, life-preserving state room. It, it was patented, as I said, in 1858. The life-preserving state room uh, sat on the deck of a ship. If the ship began to sink, uh, the state room would automatically detach from its fastenings and, and float off the deck. After the passengers got inside of it. Right? Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the passengers would have to get inside, right. and <laughs> and it would hold it would hold three or four people, right. and, and there were actually berths um, for the three or four people, you know, to sleep in. It, it had ventilation, it had light, it had compartments for for food and, and fresh water, and it and it could be steered from inside by the occupancy of of the um, stateroom, and. The stateroom actually looks like a, a prop from uh, Jules Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, actually, there's other uh, life-preserving um, models in my collection. I, I have couches that, that turn into a boat, and, and they had oars. They actually were on the side of the couches um, you know, during the day. Um, there, there's chairs that turn into personal uh, floating um, 
devices. I don't think these ever made it into production. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then an actual sleeping berth that one would have been sleeping on during the, the night, but if the ship sinks, you would actually take this uh, sleeping berth and, a, and it would turn into a, a boat that could be steered. Right. Uh, let me point out that um, this is one of our mystery models in the exhibition. We have a, a special case of five mystery models, and this one is so weird it became one of them. So. Uh, what we did was uh, provide a clue on the, the, the label. So you're supposed to guess the purpose of the invention by the clue. So the clue for this one was, is May Day. But take a look at the, take a look at the case. It's kind of a, add a little life to the exhibition. And you have more favorites. Well, another one would be, um, would, would be an invention by Ole Bull. And Bull was a famous Norwegian uh, violinist, but however, this invention was for an improvement uh, in pianos. And, and the, the piano actually was a grand piano. His patent mainly uh, uh, revolved around the improvements to, to the sound of the piano. And he accomplished this uh, by making improvements to the, to the soundboard of the piano, by making the, the string bridge hollow, and making the legs on the piano hollow, and he put in a baffling system that, that I believe with a pedal could be opened or closed. And, and to prevent the sound from uh, vibrating and escaping through the floor, he used glass casters on the, on the piano. Wow. And, and I know, Charles, you know a lot more about the history of well, Ole Bull. Maybe yeah. you could tell us a little bit about him. Ole Bull was indeed a famous Norwegian violinist. And as a child prodigy at age nine, he performed solo with the Bergen Philharmonic Symphony. Um, he uh, built a very exotic villa. Here he is, actually, with his violin. But he built this very exotic villa for himself on an island in Norway in 1873. But in 1852, he purchased 120,000 acres in northern Pennsylvania as a Norwegian colony to encourage Norwegian immigrants to come to this country. Unfortunately, he failed. It failed. All the immigrants were farmers, and it was total forest land and mountains. <laughs> but part of it became the Ole old, old, Bull State Park. But he also had a Stradivarius violin and here it is, and it's actually in the collection of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and it's on view there right now if you want to go see it. When Ole Bull died in 1880, his funeral was described as the most spectacular in the history of Norway, and his body was accompanied by 15 steamers and hundreds of, hundreds of vessels that escorted his body to its final resting place. So he was quite a character. And I think you have one last favorite, right? Well, the, the last one would be the pigeon starter. And, and, not, the, not and, quite the and, and the pigeon starter is, um, is, is very, very popular. It, it's actually, um, it's been on the, on the Today Show, it's been on the Dick Cavett Show, and it's been published in, in many, many um, mm -hmm. different articles and magazines. Um, over, over the years. The, the, this odd-looking device um, is one of the most unu unusual and intriguing models in my entire collection. The, the shooting of live pigeons during the 1800s was, was a very, very popular uh, sport for, for target shooting. And the pigeons were kept in, in traps uh, below the grade surface, and when it was time, they would open up the cages, the, the pigeons would mull, come out of the cages, mull around on the ground, and in the inventor's words, the, the sportsmen would, would be yelling at the pigeons and throwing stones at the pigeons to, to get them into flight. And this inventor, Henry Rosenthal from Brooklyn, um, came up with a, what he thought obviously was a brilliant idea, and that was to, to build this uh, animal-like figure that would get into a crouching position. It would have a rip cord. You would pull the, the rip cord. The animal would pop up. It would make a very, very loud noise. 
and the pigeons would go into flight and the sportsmen would then shoot the live pigeons. Well, soon, a soon afterwards, um, the shooting of live pigeons was, um, was banned and, and, and an inventor uh, named George Legowski um, came up with a great idea and that was he formed a clay disc that he patented and that clay disc became known as a clay pigeon, obviously from the use of, of, of pigeons um, prior to that. And the sport took on the name of trap shooting. And trap shooting because obviously the, the pigeons were kept in traps um, in the ground originally. And trap shooting uh, today is um, still a very, very popular sport. It's, it's practiced here. It, it actually started in England and this is where trap shooting emanated from back in these days right. in the 1800s. Uh, the Pat specifications described this critter as a cat, but to me it looks more like a cross between a dog and a sheep. <laughs> so it, it's definitely homemade. <laughs> but then we have the star of the show, and this will be the last model. Well. The, the mousetrap was um, actually co-inventors. You know, there were two inventors that did this, John Kopis and, and George Bauer, and they actually were from Washington, D.C. Um, this is a humane uh, mousetrap, similar today to, a, to a, what they call a, a have a heart trap, um, where the mice are captured alive and then can be let go in, in some other area. I'm not sure where people let them go, but... Uh, <laughs> But that was the idea, and of course, there still today is um, our, our humane traps where the mice are not killed. The, the trap contained four platforms that were spring-loaded, and on, on top there, of the box, there was a place uh, to, to, to bait it, um, most likely with cheese. When the mouse came up onto the trap and then climbed up on it and, and took the bait, that would release the spring and, and the bottom platform would then open up and the mouse would drop into the box and, and be Rotate. trapped because when that happened, the, the next platform rotated up um, and that would have been, been baited um, prior to, to setting it out. And this actually had uh, four uh, platforms and, and four trap doors. So it could catch four mice before it would have to be, um, be, be rebated. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the, the great essayist, essayist, said in a lecture in 1871, if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. And, and, and that expression has been shortened, but that was actually the, the original expression. Well, 4,400 inventors, I guess, took him uh, by his word <laughs> because that's how many patents have been received um, in the U.S. Patent Office from, from the inception of, of the Patent Office. And out of the 4,400, only about 25 of them ever were, um, were profitable. But in 1895, uh, John Mast of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, invented the, the snap trap. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with it and have seen it and probably have used them. And, and that snap, tra snap trap actually shut at 38 thousandths of a, of a second. The, today, the, the Woodstream Company manufactures this, uh, the same trap uh, <coughs> under the Victor name and sells over 10 million of them a year, which is over 60% of the world's market for, for, for mousetraps. And the reason is it's, it's very, very effective. It's, it's simple in design and, it, and it's cheap to manufacture. They cost less than 50 yeah. cents even right. today. Excellent, so right. I think there's probably enough patents for mousetraps now. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Alan, we're except for the artificial leg, were any of the inventions in the exhibition ever commercially produced? Well, further research um, 
has told me that, yes, the, the sewing machine um, by inventor um, Israel Rose was put into production. And the other that, one that was... That's an improvement on this. It's, it's an improvement, yes, not the first one. Yeah. And, and the other one that um, I found out that was put into production is the electromagnetic motor um, by Gao Mei. Uh -huh. Now, it's not impossible that some of the others have, but research has to be done um, on those. And someday we may find that you know, some of the others possibly may have been put into production. Right. But Everyone. we know of those three right now. Every inventor wanted to make his fortune. Uh, uh, th that concludes our program, but we do have about 10 minutes for questions, if anyone has questions. We also have assistants that would bring a microphone to you so you could share your question with the audience. Yes, over here. Uh, how did you decide which models to donate <clears throat> The, the, the question was, uh, how did Alan decide which models to donate to this museum and which to donate elsewhere? Well, the models that um, I have donated uh, to this museum was, um, was done um, between myself and, and Charles and, and, and Betsy Bruin, the director of the museum, along, I believe, with a committee. And no committee. No committee. <laughs> <laughs> Betsy doesn't like committees. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan was very generous in just letting us select what we wanted, not only from the exhibition, but from the rest of the, uh, the collection. And uh, we really used a variety. We wanted variety. We wanted some recognizable, some not. We wanted some aesthetic appeal to them. So that was our criteria. Yeah. Um I wanted them to have um, models that were appropriate for, for the Smithsonian and for this museum. So the models that did get donated are, are some of um, the, the very, very uh, best in, in the collection. But I, I do believe that they're in the, in the right home. Right. Any more um, In the back, yes. Yes, um, my name is Townsend Gilbert and Alan, it's wonderful to see you again. My dad was O. Rondo Gilbert, who bought these models back in 1939. And this, what Alan has created here, and what he has done, has, has always been my dad's dream. He, we had these models, we lived with these models for 40 years. <laughs> you talk about Alan having the models he had, we had over probably 75 to 100,000 of these and all over, but uh, the dream my dad had was to have the American public, and that's what you've done, Alan, and my hat goes off to you. It's very hard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. he, found, he found that these were extraordinary things. Every model, as you said, Alan, there was, you know, we mm -hmm. came across the first one my dad ever, ever sold was the Gatling gun. Wow. And models of that nature that, that were in our original collection that he bought. But this is a wonderful thing you've done, Alan, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Some you. other questions here? Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi. I know that the uh, National Museum of American History has a collection of patent models also. Is there a new competition coming up? <laughs> yes, the uh, Smithsonian's National Museum of American History has 12,000 patent models, almost none of which are ever shown. And that was our first resource to try to borrow patent models there, and it proved extremely difficult. Um, just won't say any more than that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Here in the front. Uh, my, my own collecting is limited to bicycles. And, and my question is simply, how did you get your wife on board? <laughs> <laughs> 
that, that's a very, very good question, but, at, but I have to say Anne has, has been wonderful with the collection and, and she does a, a lot of the, of the research and, and helps mm. me basically really every, every day. So I'm, I'm very thankful to her that she has been uh, such, a, such, such a help to me. And it's been a wonderful experience for both of us. We've traveled all over the country and, and, and met all kinds of um, individuals, famous inventors, and we've had famous inventors actually visit our, our home. And people come from all over, all over the country and outside the country to actually see the models. So she's been part and parcel of this from when I started. I don't know about the bicycle part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've, we've gone over time, and I know you'd like to go to the reception and the special viewing of the models. So uh, let's conclude here. And uh, when you leave the auditorium, you can just simply walk across the courtyard, up a flight of stairs to the second floor, and the reception will be there. So thank you very much for coming.